Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday night class. Welcome on Facebook. Welcome those in the sanctuary. This microphone is really loud tonight. Now we're good? We just now start? We fixed the audio. Okay. Now I can actually hear myself think. Anyway, let's start with some prayer requests. Who has some? What a fantastic week we're all having. No prayer requests. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Burke Childers is having surgery to have a mass removed from his kidney, and Donna Elshire's surgery got pushed out. So we still need to continue to remember that. I have a doctor's appointment on Friday. I need a little extra prayer for that. Ramonda has a doctor's appointment. Oh, I have a son who is up at MEPS right now. What a, what a long story and journey that has been. He, uh, when he was about eight years old, we found out he had a lazy eye, and we tried to patch it, and he would cheat and turn his head and look through the hole in the patch. And because of the lazy eye, they've turned him down a couple times, and he finally got a waiver, and then they still told him no, but then they decided to accept the waiver. So we're, we're kind of hoping that all works out for him. So if y'all remember that, that'd be great. Any others? Daryl Adams. Anybody else? Consultation for surgery and your children children still need Jesus. Where's a, there's a lot of, there's a, well, I guess we all need Jesus, don't we? Yeah, we all need Jesus. But, you know, maybe some people need to meet him. Yeah. I understand that. All right, let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to bow before you. We want to worship you. We want to praise you. You are the only one worthy of any praise that we have. And we just thank you for allowing us to even praise you to even worship you, to, to get to be in your presence, to get to come boldly to the throne of grace and just be with you. And Lord, I, I just want to thank you for, for being in our lives, not just part of our lives, but being active and initiative in our lives and making things happen and moving on our behalf. And Lord, I just pray that we can understand, we can see, and we can appreciate what you are really doing for us. Lord, just be with these prayer requests. We bring them to you and hope that, that the outcome is what we want. However, Lord, we understand that you have our best interest at heart. So just be with us, be with the situations, and just help us through these times, help us to understand these times. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this evening, we're going to continue on this examination of old scripture. Uh, we're going to take a deeper look at some of these old stories, some of these old laws and statues that are in the book of Leviticus. Um, and I, I would say this, if you've never read the, the book of Leviticus, I would strongly encourage you to do so. There, to me, there's just some really weird stuff in it. And it. Just stuff that just makes me go, why? Why this? And if you're anything like me, I love the question of why because it makes me start to dig a little deeper, and it gives me a little bit more meaningful understanding. Then again, sometimes I wish I didn't find some of these things out. There's some of these old laws and statutes that I read, and I find out why, and I go, oh, I really wish I didn't know that. Uh, like, don't eat shrimp. Now, the Bible doesn't specifically say don't eat shrimp. It says if it comes out of the ocean, make sure it has fins and scales. But I start looking at it, and I'm going, wow, well, I like shrimp. Why can't I eat shrimp? I started doing some scientific studies on shrimp, and I'm just going to tell you now, that is one of the filthiest creatures on the planet. 
It is basically the cockroach of the ocean. They're gross. Yeah, I know. I'm, they taste delicious. And, and Ramonda's up here sticking her fingers in her ears. She don't want to hear it. And I know there's a lot of people who don't want to hear that, but it's a dirty, dirty animal. <laughs> like I said, I wish I didn't know this. Crawfish boils are good. Crab is good. Lobster is good. Catfish doesn't have scales, but you know what? It's still good. But it's not good for you. All I can say is thank God for Acts chapter 10. Which, by the way, is where there's a vision and he gets to see all the food and it's all basically lawful to eat. This evening we're going to take a look into something that doesn't really seem to apply to us anymore, however. Something that was apparently a very big problem back in the biblical days, but something I'm going to be willing to bet that we don't even hear of anymore. Tonight we're going to talk about leprosy. In Leviticus, this disease is given two chapters, two whole chapters. Now, there are several stories about leprosy in the Old Testament and the New Testament. As a matter of fact, it's mentioned over 40 times. So it seems like there, there might be something kind of here to examine, something to look at. And in many churches and many church Christian belief systems, we place so much emphasis on so many other sins such as homosexual, big sin. It's mentioned nine total times. Leprosy is mentioned 40 times. Sexual immorality is given one chapter in the book of Leviticus. Leprosy is given two. Now, I don't want anybody to walk out of here and say, you know, Dell doesn't think sexual immorality is a big deal or homosexuality is not a big deal. That's not at all what I'm saying. It destroys lives. It destroys homes. It is a big deal. But sometimes I think some of these sins kind of puts us on a pedestal every once in a while. I go, I'm, I'm not homosexual. I've never been homosexual. I've never had a desire to be homosexual. Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, that I'm not like this tax collector over here. That's out of Luke 18, chapter or verse 11, by the way. Why don't we look at leprosy? Sometimes we place emphasis on the smallest details when God says, there's kind of some bigger fish over here to look at. So why do we place so much emphasis on certain sins but almost ignore leprosy today? I think the answer is simple. I don't know anybody with leprosy. I've never met anybody with leprosy. I'm going to be willing to bet. That, is anybody in here, please, if you have, raise your hand, that you have know someone or even know someone who knows someone who has ever had leprosy? Nobody? Apparently, it does still go on today. In some third world countries, there is still kind of an issue with it, uh, but they... It, it's very treatable these days, so we don't, we don't think about this too much. But it's something that in the Bible, it's a big deal. So that kind of means to me that maybe we shouldn't just brush this off. And if through this entire series that we've been going through, if I've shown you nothing else, I would hope that you see the spiritual implications to these stories, to some of these laws, to some of these statutes. So what is leprosy? How does it affect the person? What are the signs and symptoms? Has anybody ever studied leprosy? I hadn't until this week. I'm just going to be right honest. I'd read over that passage a hundred times and never stopped to say, what is this? So I want to give you a little bit of scientific background to what this disease is. Leprosy is caused by infection with the bacteria Microbacterium leprae. I worked all week to say that, by the way. I just want you to know it. Microbacterium leprae. M-Y-C-O-B-A-C-T-E-R-I-U-M L-E-P-R-A-E. It mainly affects the skin, eyes, nose, and peripheral nerves. Symptoms include light-colored or red skin patches with reduced sensation, numbness, 
weakening in the hands and feet. Usually the first signs of leprosy is a patch, just a little tiny patch. I actually tried to look at some pictures. You don't want to look at too many pictures of this. It's, it's rough. But it starts off as a little tiny patch that tend to have hazy edges. On the affected area, the person might lose their sense of touch, their hair, or be unable to sweat. Leprosy bacteria are the only bacteria known to invade nerves. When left untreated, those swollen nerves can cause even further complications. Sometimes the nerves have to be removed, and sometimes they impair the use of muscles and the ability of s to sense touch more widely. So it might just start in a small area, but over time, you're going to lose your sense of feeling. Leprosy patches can't produce sweat, which causes dryness and cracking. This can result in wounds and infections, especially on the hands and feet. Small wounds can easily become infected during all activities of daily living and work, especially if you're some kind of laborer. You work out in the field somewhere and you've got a spot on your foot, you don't know it, it doesn't sweat, it cracks, and then you have this big hole in your foot, basically. This can cause an inward curling of fingers and toes and a drop in the wrist and foot. Leprosy can also affect the many muscles and nerves that produce and control a person's eyes. This can result in blindness and is especially frequent in advanced cases of leprosy. When we combine the nerve damage, not being able to feel something, and add blindness into it, this becomes pretty serious. We start to see the quality of life that is almost impossible to live and remain alive. If we spend time reading books, articles, and blogs that deal with leprosy, the stories start to become graphic and even nauseating. Trust me, they do. I tried it this week, and there were many times I just had to shut the computer and walk away. As a matter of fact, for me to just stand here and say the word leprosy anymore makes me not feel very good. Um, I, I can't wait to get through this and not revisit it because I'm sick of saying the word. And you'll be sick of hearing it by the end of this. Stories abound about bodily harm due to the loss of the pain mechanism, which is necessary for a healthy body. Here are a few examples. Reaching into a fire to retrieve dropped bits of food. And these are actual cases that have been reported. The leprous person did not even react, but the doctor knew that the damage was done. And it would, have, and it would have to be treated somehow, or infection would set in. There are many stories of terrible cuts, fingers being crushed, etc. If these weren't treated, infection set in, there is tissue loss, and eventually bone loss. Fingers and toes are actually shortened. And there is no pain mechanism to curb this behavior. There's actually stories of people falling asleep in third world countries with leprosy, not being able to feel their hands and having their fingers chewed off by rats. They didn't even know it. Y'all sick of hearing about it yet? Well, I've, I've done it for a week, so you get to listen to an hour. A healthy person would understand that the injury of this sort needs to be treated, rested, and allowed to heal. Not so when there isn't any pain. The leprous person continues to use the limbs, leading to permanent injury. Blindness, as I said in advanced cases. Did you know that blinking is an involuntary action? We all think it's involuntary. But our brain actually tells us when to blink. You ever notice that when you're in a wind or there's sand, you blink a lot more, but in a setting like this, you blink a lot less because your eyes feel the need to blink because they have to remain lubricated. There are tiny pain receptors on the surface of the eye that give the brain the signal that there better be a blink or the eye is going to get raw and irritated. As we can see, this is a pretty nasty disease. But again, I'm going to say that we probably have never met anybody with this terrible disease. So why is there so much emphasis in the Bible on this? 
we're going to look at something called spiritual leprosy, which I think is a much more impactful thing in our lives today. 2 Timothy 3.16, why all this about leprosy? All Scripture is breathed out of God and profitable for teaching, for reproof and correction, and for training in righteousness. These 40 times that it's mentioned, these two chapters in Leviticus, there's a reason for it. And here's our reason, because it's profitable for teaching, for reproof and correction, and for training in righteousness. And if you all remember, when we very first started all this, what was my beginning idea? The Word of God is active and alive. So let's dive into this spiritual implication of leprosy. I almost feel as if the examination of the physical is so plain that we really shouldn't even need to look at that. Does anybody see a spiritual implication here yet? Not you will. Many of us already know a little about this from the Bible, such as when a leper walks down the street, they have to cry out, unclean, unclean. They weren't allowed to be around the general public. They were also made to wear ripped clothes that were only fit to be burned. And in more severe cases, the infection person, the infected person was made to live in a leprosy camp with other lepers. They were pushed out of the city, couldn't even be around everybody else. There's been a couple times in the scriptures where God shows up and the person screams, back away, I'm unclean. Isaiah 6, 5. And I said, woe to me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Leprosy is our natural condition with God. Unclean. And what we find is we're unclean because of our sin. And how does leprosy work? It starts on the surface, but then it gets skin deep. Sin is deeper than just the surface. Leviticus 13.3 And the priest shall examine the diseased area of the skin and his body. And if the hair in the diseased area has turned white and the disease appears to be deeper than the skin of the body, it is a case of leprous disease. When the priest has examined him, he shall pronounce him unclean. And I don't know about you guys, but it was a long time in my life where I had to go to the priest. He pointed out to me my uncleanliness. We like to think that our sin is little. We categorize it thinking my sin is not so great. I can watch this video. No one's going to know. At least I'm out looking for prostitutes, right? I have a right to be angry about this. No one else would understand anyway. Who's going to know? It won't hurt anybody. We've all said these justifications in our our head. The beginning signs of leprosy is the small discolored spot on the skin. You get a spot on your leg, and you just put pants on. Nobody's going to see it. But it develops into so much more. Doesn't our sin do the same thing? Sure, I'll take a beer. Yeah, I'll take another one. Oh, what do you have? I haven't tried that drug. Ooh, let me try this one. And what started off as a night of good time with my friends has turned into a full-blown addiction. The bacteria will invade our lives and penetrate more than just the outside layer and will eventually become a defiling illness in our spirit and our soul. Leprosy has a long incubation period and can sometimes take decades for the signs to show. Decades. Does that scare anybody else? It does me. Maybe that little tiny sin that I 
I did a few years ago. It's just waiting. It's just waiting to come back and bite me. Aren't there sins in our lives that maybe we have committed for years and we become numb to it? We don't even feel it anymore. We don't even pay attention. It's causing spiritual nerve damage and we don't even know it yet because sometimes it takes decades. Numbers 32, 23. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. Nobody's going to see me. I can get away with that just that one time. It's going to find you out. It's going to find me out. And then it's going to incubate for years. Sometimes we flirt and play with sin for so long we don't even feel the pain of it anymore. We become blind to the fact that our sense of feeling is gone. We can't feel it anymore. We can't see it anymore. And the quality of our spiritual life begins to suffer. Just like leprosy, sin also spreads. Leviticus 13.8 And the priest shall look, and if the eruption has spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a leprous disease. So, back when I was growing up, teenage years, I went to church every week, every time the doors were open. And does anybody remember the purity rings? You put the ring on. We got somebody who remembers them at least. Okay, You put the purity ring on, and anytime you were tempted to do some physical activity with the opposite sex, you look at your ring and go, no, I'm going to remain pure. And I wore one of these. And it was supposed to symbolize my covenant with my future spouse and with God. I'm not even sure if it's still a thing. Has anybody heard of these lately? Are they still a thing? They are still a thing. Great. I think they should be. I think it's a good idea. I remember the night... I broke that covenant. I'm 15 years old. I go to a Baptist church that seemed like everything was a sin. Very legalistic place. Everything you do is sinful. We couldn't even wear shorts. We were not allowed to wear shorts. I had an argument with a pastor one time about wearing shorts. So holding the hand of a female or even giving them a kiss, boy, that, that's, that's big time. To kiss a girl was just unacceptable, but I was 15. And I'd been asked to go to this homecoming dance with a girl who lived in Huntington. And I struggled with this idea of purity because I'm going all the way to Huntington And I live in South Point, and when I go all the way to Huntington, no no one is going to know what I'm doing. I can get away with it. It'll be fine. Yeah, I'm out of state. The people that I go to church with weren't going to be there. The people I went to school with that knew me weren't going to be there. So I decide that this one evening, I'm going to take the purity ring off. I never put it back on. I had decided I'm going to hold hands with this girl and I might even sneak a kiss in during a slow dance. That was my intent. Before the end of the night, I was making out with a completely different girl in the hallway. (laughs) This is a true story, people. I I wish it weren't, but this is a true story. (laughs) Uh, yeah, I mean, I, just, I fell right off, of the, right off the rocker. But I thought I had a free night. 
And I had absolutely no intentions of doing anything sexual. I just wanted to be able to hold the girl's hand. And I remember having this internal struggle. And I remember, I, I, I remember the conversation I had with God. And I said, you're just going to have to give me grace this time. And I decided I'm going to do this and nothing's going to stop me. And if not, then I'll deal with the consequences of my little sin. I had no idea how dangerous this thought process was. That evening did not end well for me, needless to say. You know, the date that I go with is not the date that I end up with. And the date that I went with was actually my ride home. I had to call, I had to call mom that night. She wasn't real happy either. I broke my covenant that I'd made that evening. And it spread. And it spread like wildfire. Especially in a 15-year-old. There was no stopping me. And this led to premarital sex, porn addictions, and a failed unfaithful marriage. Not, not to her. She's, she's the good wife. But, but I had, I've had a failed marriage. All because of a small sin I chose when I was 15 years old. It took 10 years for that to come to fruitation. What a slippery slope it was. And I become numb to that sin. I didn't feel it no more. I didn't even see it as sin no more. I just said, everybody else is doing it. What's the big deal? I was blind to the damage it had caused, and the eruption had spread to the noticeable parts of my life. And it was no longer just a small patch of skin anymore. For the past several weeks, I've actually used this piece of scripture right here. And boy, did it come to mind the other day when I'm writing this. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven lumps the whole lump? Leavens the whole lump? And if we remember this, this is about sin. A little bit of sin can expand on us. Something as small as a decision to hold a girl's hand when I was 15 destroyed a marriage when I was 24. Maybe your story doesn't involve a ruined marriage, but I'm sure we all have something in our life that we thought was small that turned into something much larger and a bigger problem later. If not... Great, Jesus didn't come for you. He came for me. Sin defiles and isolates. The leprous person who has disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. When I go through and I, and I do these lessons, I, I always take the scriptures and I make them bold and italicize and put them in red letters so that it comes to my attention and I copy and paste them out of the internet and I always delete the little A in the brackets and he left it up there. I guess I have to read from my screen from now on because I almost said A. <laughs> One of the worst parts of sin is we're alone in it. This is the worst part of leprosy, in my opinion. It's not the sores or the loss of feeling or the blindness. It's the isolation. Those with leprosy were not free to just go into the temple to try to have sacrifices made for their sin. They were cut off from society. Not only that, but they had to pronounce themselves coming in Anywhere they went. Could you imagine having to announce your worst sin when you walked in somewhere? Walk in Walmart. Drug addict. Drug addict. Somebody else is walking by. Adulterer. Two-faced liar. Could you imagine having to walk around that way? And this is what a leprous person has to do. 
and then not being able to be at social functions and having to live alone away from their families. Like this wasn't a thing where I get sick and I bring all my family with me. My family stays. And they tell me, you got to go. I'm by myself. Yet in our sin, this is exactly what we do. We hide it, thinking no one else sees it. We don't want to tell anybody until it becomes too evident in our lives. We've all seen the husband with nothing but contempt for his wife because he thinks the grass is greener somewhere else. We have seen the drug addict life that looks hopeless. Do you know that most addicts think they have it under control? I had it under control for years until I was jobless and realized I didn't have anything under control. An addict spends most of his time alone because there's not many people who want to be around him. And they're trying to hide their addiction. And if I just stay home and I don't go out on any social functions with you guys, I can sit in the house and I can do drugs all night and you don't know that I'm doing it. But if I come out with you, I can't do that stuff. And that creates a problem for me physically because I'm addicted. Next thing about leprosy that we see, leprous garments are only fit for the fire. We clothe ourselves in sin. And the only thing it's good for is to be burned. And he shall burn the garments or the wrap or the wolf Wolf, wolf, the wool or the linen or any article made of skin that is disease. For it is a persistent leprous disease. It shall be burned in the fire. This is where we are to take our garments of our sinful life and throw them in the fire. It's the only place for it. The clothes the leprous person the clothes the leprous person sometimes I type things I don't know what I really meant. Their clothes were unhealthy. Many times we see the garments of people's sin, and we can see that it's unhealthy. Anybody in here ever actually met a, a, a drug addict? I, I imagine most of us had, unfortunately, in this area. There's quite a few of them. Has a drug addict ever had to come to you and say, hey, I'm a drug addict? They don't need to. You can see it. You can see their clothing. And what if they never repent of that sin? What if they remain in those garments? Some people hold on to their sin so tight and they don't want to let it go. They want Jesus to be part of their life. They want to be forgiven of their sins. But they don't want to let go of it. Did it for years. I wanted Jesus to tell me all the really neat things, but I didn't want to change. I wanted to be who I was. They pick and choose what they want to show people and what they want to give to Christ. And they remain in the garments of leprosy that are only good for the fire. Now this evening we have, we've looked at some Old Testament scripture and we've talked about some pretty negative things. As I was doing the study, as I'm looking at it, I'm going, man, this is really drab and this is really dreary and, you know, how am I supposed to apply this to our lives then I started to realize something there's stories in the New Testament too about leprosy there are people in the New Testament who told Jesus I'm unclean stay away from me one of them was Simon Peter a disciple that Jesus loved but when Simon Peter saw it, this is the first time he, he had ever met Jesus. He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Luke 7, 6. And Jesus went with them, 
When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you under my roof. Our sin makes us feel unworthy of Christ. We don't feel, we don't feel we're worthy because of our spiritual leprosy. You know what the gospel is? Everybody says the gospel is the good news. Well, what's the good news? Jesus is not scared of your sin. He's not scared of your leprosy. How do we know this? That was a slide I told him to put in there. And he's willing to make us whole. Matthew 8, 1 through 3. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper. He almost got that bracket out of there. A leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. He touched a leper. People were scared to death of lepers. He wouldn't even go near him. Here Jesus is touching him. I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he was clean. Could you imagine waking up one morning, walking down the street, having to yell, unclean, unclean, unclean. I've got these raggedy robes on. I've lived in isolation. And then he comes across Jesus and he says, hey, hey, I know who you are. And you can make me clean if you will. And walking away from that encounter, clean, back in society, throwing off these sinful clothes and being made whole. Luke 17, 11 through 19. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And he was going into a village. Ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out to him in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when they saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. We're going to get back to that. He was a Samaritan point here in a second. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. It was either last week or the week before. I showed a a pie chart and it made the statement that 1% of Christians have read the Bible all the way through. Apparently the, uh, the odds weren't as great back then either. Jesus will do everything for you. And apparently... Not many of us are going to come back and actually give him credit for it. Everyone avoided these people. No one would touch them. No one would even come close to them. These men had to cry out unclean. But Jesus cried out to them, be clean. How many times did we hear Jesus say, go and sin no more? That's what he's telling these guys. You're clean now. I've redeemed you. Jesus didn't just heal the one, but reached out and touched him. In his disease and sickness, in his sin and unworthiness, Jesus wasn't afraid. Jesus wasn't concerned about the mess that this man's life was in. And he reached out and he changed all of it. In the second story, he heals ten. And only one comes back to praise him. That one that came back was a foreigner. What this screams to me is there are church people being healed of their sin every day, but it's the one that's out there in the street that doesn't know him, that is hopeless. That's the one who's going to praise him when when he's healed. Sometimes I feel like we take our grace for granted. 
And there are people out there who need grace that have never been told grace. And if someone would just tell them, they'd walk down the street praising God. We all know what the Great Commission is, right? Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I will am with you always to the very end of the age. And you all know I like my challenges, so I'm going to go ahead and throw out my challenge for the week. Of the ten, which leper are you going to be? Because we've all had this spiritual leprosy. We've all lost feeling. We've all been blind. And Jesus has reached out and touched us and said, be clean. What are we going to do with that? I don't want to be one of the nine. I don't want to be one of them that Jesus says, hey, where'd they go? Didn't I heal them too? Don't they have a reason to praise? I want to be the one that comes back. I want to be the grateful leper. Because I am the foreigner. I am the Samaritan. I was unworthy. And my clothes were only fit for the fire. And he took those clothes and he gave me something new. And if we're not telling somebody, then we're like the other nine. I always finish early, and I mentioned this to my wife, and she says, maybe you should ask questions every once in a while. And I said, well, nobody answers any questions if I ask it. So I'll just go ahead. Does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? Oh, we got one. Wow, look at this. I don't have a microphone. I wasn't prepared. You would. <laughs> That's how I came here. Bef well, how long has the church been here? 16 years now? Something like that. I came here the year after, and it was the first year of the pastor appreciation. And uh, I had a little antique shop here in South Point, and I was so unworthy. I'm going to cry. I don't really cry very much anymore, over it, but it was a time in my life I'd been married twice, and I was leaving my husband because he was abusive. And um, I just had made up my mind I wasn't going to church anymore. And so um, Vicki and her sister-in-laws and everybody came into my little antique shop. And um, they told me they'd come to this church. And I'd come by the church when I was over to the funeral home, by the, where the funeral home is now, all the time. And... Um, because I lived down on Salt, and I'd see him doing things. I see him having cookouts, and look like they're having a great time. And and I wondered about that place. I didn't really know it was a church. And then they told me that's what it was. And they were here on that uh, to celebrate the first year's pastor appreciation. And so um, they invited me to come to church. And I said I don't go to church anymore. And um, I just felt so unworthy. And so unclean. And um, I said, I've been married twice and I'm getting divorced and um, I just don't go. And so they said, we'd love for you to come. And I said, no, I won't come. I just won't come. So um, they all left and they come back and asked me if they could pray with me. And of course, you know, being a preacher's kid, I'm like, sure, you can pray with me. So we prayed and I felt very burdened. And um, they said, we really come back too because we want to buy a bicycle for the pastor's wife. And I was like, I can't sell them a bicycle. 
I, I'm like, I can't charge you for a bicycle. It's pastor's wife, you know. So I said, I'll give you the bicycle, but I won't charge you for the bicycle. And they're like, well, you'll have to bring it to us. <laughs> ah, trapped. <laughs> and I'm like, at the church? <laughs> they said, yeah, I'm like, I can't do that. No, you'll have to. <laughs> we don't have no way to get there. So anyway, that's how I came to this church. So they tricked me. And I came, and they sat with me, and they all thought I was Vicky's sister. And um, that's how I came to Tri-State Worship, and it changed my life. And then... Um, People prayed with me. I went out and prayed, and I've spent many a time on that altar. But I prayed for a, a long time, many services. But uh, what I learned about this church that I didn't have anywhere else, and I was raised in church, was about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It changed my life. And I'm still here. I'm still here. So that's, you know, thank you. Oh, I wouldn't go anywhere else. <laughs> I love my church. It's still standing. Does, does anybody else want to tell their leprosy story? Yeah. No? Okay. Two, three, four, five. Oh, there's a few more than ten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing us to see and understand these stories and we can see them as factual things we can see them as parables we can read them as history we can read them as academic but Lord I pray that we read them so they penetrate our lives they penetrate our hearts and they change us and they allow us to walk out and scream that we are clean and maybe those around us that knew us when we weren't, they can see that and it will burden them as well. Lord, I just pray that as we, as we continue through our week, through our lives, that we don't just go through and look at the physical part of everything, that we see you everywhere. That we see your guidance in our lives. We see your guidance in those around us. Just help us to recognize it and to praise you with everything we have. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for just allowing this life that we have that lets us draw closer to you. We ask these things in your name. Amen.